Welcome to Zero to Start, a podcast about Unity VR development from concept to Oculus test channel with your hosts, Ceciliana Trevino and Melanie Mansell. On Zero to Start, we go behind the scenes of building Melanie's first VR experience that she's submitting to the Oculus Start program for independent developers. Start provides access to Oculus hardware, developer tools, community of network, and other resources. Getting into the program will help bring VR development and education to Berkeley Community Media, where I'm the outreach director. In the midst of the COVID global health crisis, as everyone is resetting and processing a new normal, we remain sheltered in place, collaborating from home, and somewhat to our surprise, we're making significant progress on setting up Melanie's Unity project. During her <laughs> dev time, we not only opened the project, but we named it and, or you named it. Did I name it? You named it. I think you were like, Melanie, this is your oasis. So it became a mashup of Melanie and Oasis. So it's Moasis, a place where you find your inner peace. Basically, the idea of bringing more peace to your inner and outer life experience through this new visual and auditory experience that we're creating in VR. And before we get into the dev mode recap, I wanted to ask you about the news. Everyone in VR seems to be talking about the release of Unreal 5. The Twitterverse and the news feeds were definitely lit up with North Carolina-based Epic Games releasing their groundbreaking version of Unreal Engine, their game development platform, and one of Munity's main competitors. The big news around Unreal 5's release is two new core technologies, Nanite Geometry and Lumen Global Illumination. Nanite Geometry is a streamed and scaled real-time technology that eliminates a lot of the time constraints around designing 3D graphics. And Lumen is a fully dynamic global illumination solution that immediately reacts to scene and light changes. These compose a fundamental advancement for graphics processing, world building, and filmmaking. It sounds so cool. Can't wait. The demo video is really nice. I mean, as a filmmaker, it's the complete convergence of high-end gaming graphics for cinematic applications mm -hmm. among the other powerful core technologies that they're introducing. They're going to save a lot of time and they're going to shift the way pipelines work. So do you expect that we'll be seeing a lot more virtual reality films coming out and more experiences that enable people to put on a headset. When you're looking at making things with a game engine, you're going to look at different features and benefits they each provide based on what you're trying to accomplish. And for some, that solution is unreal. And for others, it's Unity. Unity works with C Sharp and mm -hmm. Unreal works with C++. Oh, interesting. What it also changes for developers is the need to be multidisciplinary and to know how to publish from both platforms and understand the pipelines. That's what's really challenging for me as a newcomer to tech is seeing how fast these platforms shift and advance. All of a sudden, you know, someone could come out with a release and it just it changes the direction of the way people are making things. Everyone else in the field has to then Pivot. get to that level or right or look to how they're going to make their mark and make sure that people are building on their platform and buying those assets from that marketplace and you know seeding all of the jobs that will be required for making these new virtual environments that we need to exist in more and more. Mm -hmm. Unreal 5 will be available in preview in early 2021 and in full release late in 2021, supporting next generation consoles that are coming out, the current generation consoles like Xbox and Sony PlayStation, PCs, Mac, iOS, and Android. That's cool. Part of being a filmmaker today is really understanding the game making technology and game engines and how that's going to impact creating new worlds for even in a 2D space. Exciting. What a great peek at how the world of VR is being shaped by these different platforms and different innovators and evolution of how things are going. Soon after Epic Games made this announcement, Unity tweeted that 60% of AR and VR content is powered by Unity and included a link to some of their top content and tutorials through Unity Learn. We'll be sure to post that tweet in the show notes. You 
recently attended an event in Engage hosted by Caitlin Krauss from MindWise. Yeah, it was my first event in an educational meeting platform called Engage. And I got to create my cool avatar and choose her clothes and her hair and all that cool stuff. And it was a little frantic because I had signed up for the event and hadn't activated an account in Engage yet. So I had to do all this stuff fairly quickly and popped into the event and people were already in the circle overlooking the ocean. There were around 15 participants from three different continents who shared the ways that they were interacting with the environment as we were doing these different exercises and teleporting from one world to the next. And I found that Caitlin's ability to be a facilitator was awesome because she's really able to share these mindful techniques and practices uh, for presence and reflection in these worlds that were created by Chris Madsen, who is a fantastic architect. So it made me feel like virtual reality can help bring people together. It's like an exercise in collaboration, but it was really about mindfulness and being really present. And I felt really good after the experience. So I can see this as a great way to create more resilient communities and more strength and resilience in myself, you know, in my inner and outer world. (laughs) It was very interesting. So much to explore. There was a lot to explore. There were like floating elephants twirling in the air. And then Chris had these different environmental like weather patterns that would come through and you could run up and run with the zebras or sit quietly and look at the cool irises in the grass or beautiful tree full of um, sparkly angel fairy light kind of thing coming down from it. It is magical. <laughs> Great that you get to jump around into these different worlds and see how as a director, you're creating environments. The environments themselves begin to tell the story. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And what's possible, that's what really opens up. It's like, what is my end goal and the feeling that I want to impart to other people, as well as how can I, wow, that's a creative thing I didn't even know was possible. How can I also do that? It was a pretty positive experience. Congrats on setting up your project, Moasis, Melanie. Thank you. (laughs) What's your impression of choosing a render pipeline, the Unity project setting windows, and working with the Unity package manager? I think it's a pretty intense world and there's so many different little windows and sub windows that you are able to choose. It's interesting because it's very organized. And I think once I understand and keep practicing the way things all flow together, I'll be able to be more proficient. You know, it's like, it's like learning Final Cut or you know, some kind of editing program where you, once you get the rules of how things are organized and the little techniques down and where things are, then I think you can be more fluid. But right now it's a little like, what? There's all these different things everywhere, but I have a really good mentor. So I'm I'm doing good. Oh, well, (laughs) thank you. I feel really humbled by the entire process. I talk about that a lot. And there's a lot of things that I just learned through trial and error. And I'm self-taught, so a lot of the things that I go through are based on the tutorials that I've taken on YouTube or through Unity courses and some some more advanced courses, only to say that you have a lot of advantages if you're already working with a technology stack and know more about coding or know about making 2D games. But when you're coming from a filmmaking background or an editing background, there are extra layers to Unity that make it very different than learning something like Final Cut. Mm -hmm. And I think the render pipeline is one of the biggest things because when you start a project in Final Cut, your settings are your frame rate and what kinds of settings you used when you recorded the film. But when Mm -hmm. you're working with Unity, you're looking at how is the computer going to process the graphics based on what platform you're using. Right. I like the idea that you compared setting up the developer environment to a French phrase in cooking called mise en place, where, and I understand that when I was looking at the scene, you know, they have a sample scene in Unity and you're just checking things out. I was like, wow, okay, that's where that is. All your bins have your different categories of, like the scene has everything in one bin. And I have experience with construction and painting. This background in my life of being really kinesthetic 
builder and I can do it in this other space too. I think I'm, it's pretty exciting. So though it is different than editing, I still think I can get it. You can, Melanie, and you will. <laughs> <laughs> you can get it, Melanie. You- <laughs> mise en place with everything in its place, of course. We could have like a mise en place t-shirt. <laughs> oh, fancy. Do you say mise en place or mise en place? Potato, potato. I'll have to ask my French friend. I'll see tomato, her. Tomato, tomato. Yes, please, please. <laughs> okay. We, oui, we. Oui. We, oui, we. Oui. We have to cut that. I love saying that we're going to cut stuff and then we don't cut it. <laughs> Getting back to Unity. Before you can start a project in Unity, you have to pick a render pipeline. Unity has several options between 2D, 3D, lightweight render pipeline, which in newer versions of Unity is now called the universal render pipeline. And then there's the high definition render pipeline. There are different graphics processing methods based on your target hardware platform. And that really goes back to the groundbreaking announcement from Unreal 5 for that functionality and being able to reach multiple gaming platforms because the scaling happens automatically. Mm -hmm. That's so amazing. (laughs) You're in awe. You're like, "Mm -hmm." I'm like, no, I'm, mm -hmm." it's revolutionary actually. Another big announcement that they made is that they are going to only start taking royalties after your first million dollars in sales. Wow. Exciting, right? That's pretty cool. That's a good motivating factor to make a million dollars in games. Altruistic, really. It's going to change everything. To me, it's on the level of when Firewire came out. It was just straight from the camera into the computer. Right. Right. And suddenly video was not the stepchild any longer and it became (laughs) the alpha it became the primary format for making film exciting so we you know it's big news people that are working in the industry know the level and degree of impact but i think for the broader audiences and for uh, new technologists it's we're going to see the impact in a few years when it becomes you know the primary way of making games and making movies yeah honestly i feel so lucky to be entering into the realm of vr dev work right now as it's getting more streamlined because the idea that you have all these different moving parts is the process gets easier and the distribution platform won't be a, a way that's you know putting a blockade in your creative process i think that's very encouraging that's why i think it's fun to work on this project with you because i know your background in traditional video format well i do miss <laughs> i miss some of that old stuff just because it has different texture that you can add on later and after you know in your post-production but vhs video has this old nostalgic aesthetic that film i think used to have mm-hmm. interesting it's good i like you as a filmmaker making these analogies and helping me to understand in those different ways too because it's conceptually it's a whole nother world you know basically to do this. So it's cool that we're doing this podcast. I really appreciate that too, because we're also in the COVID moment that we're becoming more proficient with all these different ways of communication and conveying information and educating people on what we're up to with the project. It's pretty cool. We've been reflecting lately that our podcast playlists have become more of a barometer of life in quarantine. My playlist is The Gamma and Melanie's is Elements. What's on the rotation for this week, Melanie? A little story. My first concert when I was 13 was at the Poly Ballroom on the UC Berkeley campus. And I went to see this Japanese punk band called The Plastics and headlining were the Ramones. And my girlfriend, I know, it was super cool. My girlfriends and I had been going to rock and roll high school at the UC theater. Like we went several times to see the movie. It was a cult film. And we decided we're going to go see the Ramones at the Poly Ballroom. And we wore, all three of us wore plastic garbage bags, safety pin together in the front with flannel shirts over. And my friend April, she actually took photos. She had an old fashioned camera with film, like real film, of course, back in the day. And she was like the photographer running around the whole concert taking photos. And when the plastics went off stage and the Ramones came on, we were like whoosh, like a big tidal wave rushed to the front and our plastic bags ripped. Fortunately, we had the flannel (laughs) over. And 
unfortunately at the end we looked at her camera roll of film and she hadn't wound it correctly so we didn't get any photos but oh it was a really good experience and i just found my ramones button from the concert last night so i'm pretty stoked so i'm heading off that with playlist with their hit song I want to be sedated my feeling is at this point in the shelter in place I'm working so hard harder than ever really on finishing old projects moving forward I keep hearing that a lot people are some people are actually more busy than ever I'm like how did I have time for like going out in the mix of the music I'm including some science you know science is real kind of idea um, that we're all connected Science. (laughs) science is real with Neil deGrasse Tyson Bill Nye Carl Sagan it's cool mix up. And then I have an ode to my yoga teacher who I really miss, but I keep connected through Facebook. And I'm sharing a beautiful video that was created for her and her husband, whose name is Fletcher Oaks. And he's a pretty cool photographer and creates these tie dye things for backdrops of concerts. And it's a cover song of U2's song, Where the Streets Have No Name. And it's his images of their travels together. And then the voice of this guy, Kurt Elling, who is so deep and divine the, the words of this use two song are pretty expansive anyway so the whole feeling of it it feel, makes me feel connected and also it kind of reminded me of the time that we have here being finite you know we have mortality that we always face and then we have this choice to live as fully as we can in each moment no matter what the situation is or wherever we are I haven't finished the whole list, but those were my definites of this week. It's quite a list, Melanie. I know. <laughs> Going from punk rock all the way to the Enlightenment. <laughs> well, you know, I got to tell it like it is for myself from the moment. So what's up for the Gamma this week, Cece? We are honoring the Moasis this week in honor of your initiation into 3D VR production. Awesome. We started with New Religion by Duran Duran, a version of their live performance in London at the Hammersmith in 1982. Also to give ode to all the music festivals and gatherings that were missing during this time. Summer. Then we slide into an epic disco remix of Rod Stewart's Do You Think I'm Sexy? Because installing Unity packages is the opposite of sexy. And that remix is by DJ Disco Cat. I thought it was really cool, the description of how he ended up making this mix and all of the trials and tribulations that Rod Stewart endured after releasing this song. And people called him a sellout. So it's an interesting little conversation there in the comments. Be sure to check it out. Then we get really mellow with a few electronic house tracks and dive back into my favorite YouTube channel right now, Elf, with two tracks by Computer Data, the SF-based electronic DJ. Jill Scott with Golden enlightens the list. Then we descend into a track by Rare called Leave Me in My Broken Dreams, a hypnotic house track with big organ sounds that give me that traveling on a train feeling. And it has this surreal video that reminds you of like avant-garde films you used to watch in film school. Starts with rose-tinted shots of the Golden Gate Bridge in the fog. And I've been playing it on repeat. It's just the one that keeps me going. The Gamma concludes with a track from the 1980 album Zenyata Mandata by The Police. Of course, when the world is running down, you make the best of what's still around. Mm, Nice. I can't wait to check it out. Cool. Thanks for joining us on Zero to Start. Subscribe and listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and now our YouTube channel, where you'll also find our quarantine playlists, The Gamma, and Elements. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to the items we covered in this episode. And we want to thank our partners at Berkeley Community Media, Berkeley, and ARVR Women and Allies. Until next time. Happy installing. <laughs>